boy, I sure do love sailing off the coast of Bermuda at the end of the American Civil War. Nothing bad has ever happened off the coast of Bermuda. Oh my goodness. Men, where are we? Ah, hello sir. You appear to have come through the Tunnel of Light to a new planet. I'm sorry, what is the Tunnel of Light? Well, it's implied to be some sort of ancient alien technology that none of us understand. Oh, okay. So my entire regiment has been isekai to an alien planet? Is, is that what you're telling me? Yes, humans have been coming here accidentally for thousands of years. We have tons of small city-states scattered all throughout the planet, and we've all kept our own cultures from when we came over. Ah, well, I suppose we could make a nice new life here for ourselves. Yes, of course. You and your men are welcome. You just need to submit to the hordes. Submit to the what now? Well, they're the aliens that are native to this planet. They're like people, but they're eight feet tall, and they're always just riding around the planets in a constant nomadic migration. Every 20 years, they come here and they demand tribute from us. Well, what tribute do you give them? Oh, manufactured goods, grain, that sort of thing. Well, if we resist, we are horribly murdered. Oh, also, they eat one-fifth of us every time they come by. Wait, run that last one by me again? Yes, they have these things called slaughter pits where we are butchered like animals. In fact, they literally refer to us as cattle. What? You're no better than slaves! Well, yes, I, I suppose that is slavery of a sort. I've heard enough. Let's get them, boys. This is the introduction song. It's not very good, but it's not too long. Okay, let me start by saying I love Lost Regiment. Okay, I, I literally bought this stupid hoodie, which looks like an uh, American army uniform from uh, around the U.S. Civil War, largely because of this series. The hat I already owned, and the sword, look, the sword's decorative. It's, it's not sharp or anything, so it was really cheap. And again, I was probably gonna buy this at some point anyways, but, you know, this video is my excuse. The Lost Regiment is... It's not just that it's really good, it's that it's really good in a specific way I don't see that often. It made me patriotic for a country that doesn't exist. I think, I think that's the best way I can think to describe this and get people interested in the idea of it. Because I felt many things while reading, and most of them were good. You know, The Lost Regiment is kind of a weird sci-fi series from the 90s, but it had more emotional impact on me than most contemporary stuff that I've read lately. And it's not just that it's great military sci-fi with epic battles, because it does have plenty of that, believe me. And it's not just that I was pulled into the desperation of these people who are trying to survive. It's that watching them refuse to submit to tyranny, and how they always know that the only true weapon their oppressors had was fear, that, that was just, I guess inspiring is the best word for it, you know? Despite how scared everyone is throughout this entire series, and believe me, from the moment the main characters realize what's going on, they are just terrified from then until the very last page of what could happen to them and their loved ones. But despite how scared they were, they would rather die than allow their entire lives to be dictated by men who saw them as nothing but animals. You know, Lost Regiment is... It's my new favorite example of a genre that I call mass isekai, right? So isekai, for those unfamiliar, that's Japanese, it just means different world or other world, and it is a term for a genre where people go from our world to another one, and like that's what the story's about. You know, stuff like Alice in Wonderland, Gulliver's, Gulliver's Travels, and a shitload of anime. Like, after Sword Art Online came out and got popular, there were just so many isekai anime, I don't know how I could even begin to count them all. Mass isekai is basically the same thing, except that's when a bunch of people come together. And this is something I haven't really seen in anime, but I have seen it a lot in like Western books and stuff. And also, if I adjust this hat a lot, I think it's slightly too small for my head. <laughs> That's why. So mass isekai would include stuff like 1632, which I only read the first book of, but that's about a town from West Virginia getting sent back in time to the Germany in the middle of the Thirty Years' War. There's also Island in the Sea of Time, which I read all of. That's about Nantucket Island getting sent back to the Bronze Age. Uh, Empire of Man is a book series I read just last year. That's about a bunch of space marines being stranded on a alien planet, and it's really, really good. And 
Obviously, the mass isekai genre has a lot of overlap with military science fiction as well, which is another genre that I really like, but is not that popular. And I'll just say right now, on average, I think mass isekai is a lot better than regular isekai, especially if we're comparing it to all the anime crap that's come out in the past, like, 15 years, because regular isekai is often about how one person is some special chosen one with godly powers, whereas mass isekai is about people working as a team to build a new, new society or just, you know, trying to survive and then go home. But usually there's no way for them to go home from wherever they wind up in. And that's made really clear from early on in the story, including the Lost Regiments. Like, they barely even try <laughs> to think like, oh, is there a way we could go home? Because it's not about that. It's about building a new society. There's also usually some talk about how the author's worldview is great. You know, it's pro-democracy, pro-capitalism, generally in favor of equality and human rights. And Say what you will about mass isekai, but it does usually say that slavery is bad, which is more than I can say for a lot of regular isekai, where the main character will just buy a cute slave girl and have her be his girlfriend. That's a thing that happens a lot if you were unaware. Lost Regiment makes slavery being bad like a central theme of the entire story, but even in those other series, it's usually there somewhere. Okay, like, the sword, it, it doesn't even show up on camera. Like, if I stand on my tippy toes, you can kind of see the hilt there. And I'm kind of annoyed that I went to the trouble of, like, putting it on my belt if you can't even see it on here. My hand's just holding on to it this whole time. So the men of the eponymous Lost Regiment, they're kind of like Captain America, where they're not a realistic depiction of how Americans thought and acted back in the frickin' 1860s. Uh, in, in fact, throughout this whole series, there is surprisingly little racism, which I'll talk about a little bit more back then. But they're, they're not a realistic depiction of how Americans acted. Rather, they are a representation of the ideals that America stands for. Again, like Captain America. He was frozen in 1945, then comes to the modern day, and he's perfectly fine having a black guy as his boss. The Lost Regiment are representations of things like freedom, equality, and democracy. And throughout the whole series, they're fighting for their ideals as well as their lives at the same time. And these ideals aren't just fancy words. Like, if they're followed properly, they have a material benefit to people's lives. And again, we see that pretty clearly throughout the books. So The Lost Regiment, it's not just a great work of fiction, it's an inspiring work of fiction, and for that, I love it. But what's it actually about? I've been going on for a while. What is it actually about? It is about the men of the 35th Maine Infantry Regiment, which was not a real regiment, so don't look it up. Uh, it, w it fought in the American Civil War for several years, and just a couple of months before the war ends, they get on a ship to move to another front, specifically they're being moved from Virginia down to North Carolina, and then they accidentally activate some alien technology, there's a big flash of light, and then they get transported to a mysterious alien planet. And other humans have lived there for a long time, coming through the Tunnel of Light, and so there's, again, just humans scattered all throughout the planet. And the regiment winds up in a land called the Rus, and the people there are descendants of medieval Russians. The people of the Rus are ruled by boyars, which boyar is just a term for nobility in Russia and Eastern Europe, so it's like calling someone a duke or a baron, basically. Uh, and they are ruled by boyars as well as an authoritarian church. But the thing is, all the people, not just in the Rus, but on this whole planet, they don't have gunpowder or any sort of other advanced technology. Like, they... It, it's very much implied that the hordes are... Or, not even implied, but just the hordes are preventing them from advancing their technology in any meaningful way because they don't want them to rebel in any way. So everyone sees this fully decked out uh, group of soldiers from the mid-19th century and they are very impressed by their weapons and artillery. But before long, the men of the 35th learn about the hordes and... Like I said, the hordes are these alien nomads who are just constantly riding around the world, and they return every 20 years. So, like, that, basically they just go straight from west to east until they wind up in the exact spot they were before. And there's multiple different tribes. Like, the ones they fight in the first book uh, own this one narrow band that they ride around, but then there's one that's further south that owns that latitude. The hordes not only exact tribute in the form of, like, grain and manufactured goods and stuff, but they also just, they literally eat people. It's actually the biggest part of their diet is just humans that they come across. And they have deals with them, so they'll only eat some of them, but that's the same way you don't eat 
all of the animals at a farm. You want them to be able to reproduce and make more for next year. So the 35th Maine decides that they need to free these people, eliminate the alien threat, get rid of all the monarchies that are all over the world, and set up a proper republic where all men are equal. So we have about 500 men versus an entire planet of petty tyrants and giants ready to eat them. So to put it very, very short, this series is about a planet-wide slave rebellion. Now, if everything I've told you so far sounds dumb, that's because it kind of is, but it works because it plays itself 100% straight, you know? There aren't any Joss Whedon-esque jokes where they go, Ho! Oh, well that just happened! Or, you're telling me I have to use a musket to fight an army of giant barbarians? Well that's weird! You know, like, I say Joss Whedon-esque, but like, also just the entire Marvel Cinematic Universe is this now. The setup, sure, the setup is kind of silly, but if you were actually there with them, it would be terrifying. Which is something that goes for most fiction, if I'm, if I'm being honest here. Uh, but, you know, let's get into it further. What did I really like about this series? So first thing, I just love the idea of this being a planet-wide slave rebellion. <laughs> that sounds so awesome. Uh, the planet is also called Valenia, by the way. That's not super important, but it, it's called Valenia. Like, again, it's an isekai story, but these new guys come in, and while their weapons and engineering give the people there a chance to throw off the yoke of their oppressor, they would never even think to rebel before. Because, like, throughout a big chunk of the first book, people are seeing their weapons, and they're thinking how they can use these guys, they, they refer to them as the Yankees, uh, use the Yankees to, you know, gain more power for themselves, but it never even crosses their mind to rebel against the hordes, because they just seem so unstoppable. The real weapons that the Yankees bring are their ideas about how everyone is equal and no one should ever be a slave. Like, one of my favorite scenes in this series isn't even a battle scene or anything, it's one of the soldiers trying to explain the concept of representative democracy to a bunch of Russian peasants, and these guys are just baffled by the thought that they could choose who runs their country and replace them if they didn't like the laws that they passed. And as this American guy is explaining it to them, he straight up tells them that if they refuse to go when voted out of office, they're allowed to kill them. <laughs> and again, the, the Russians, the, the Rus, the, is that what they're usually referred to as? But that's, I don't know, slightly confusing. All, all the different cultures in this world are, again, just real world cultures with their names slightly changed, so it is a little bit confusing sometimes. But anyways, the Russians, the very idea that they could ever have control over their own lives is just inconceivable to them. And so watching all these people learn to stand up for themselves instead of meekly going to their fate is... I mean, it's amazing. It, it really is nice to watch. I have read a lot of books about rebellions over the years, but rarely do they make the faceless masses a character unto themselves, you know? And in The Lost Regiment, the faceless masses are a character. They're a character who develops, wants to be left alone, but they get squeezed until there's nothing left, and then they have no choice but to fight. And that's, again, that's, that's pretty rare. In a lot of other stuff I've read like this, it seems like everyone already wants to rebel, they're already on the edge of it, but only the protagonist, through their power of being the main character, uh, can do anything to fight the government, or like there's already just straight up a rebellion ongoing when the story begins and the main characters just join up and through the power of being the main character they win the day. Lost Regiment isn't like that. The men of the 35th Maine don't even want to start a revol revolt, they just inspire the others to do it on their own. Like the other people again hear about their ideals, they see their weapons, and they finally decide to take their lives into their own hands. Like, it, characters straight up say uh, in the last book that freedom isn't something that can be given to you, you have to take it. And again, that is a major theme that goes throughout. They just make it much more explicit in the final book. And I also just liked that it's not like they overthrow their old rulers, uh, and by that I mean like the human boyars and such that were ruling over them. It's not like they overthrow them and after that everything is great. You know, they, they set up a republic, which is just straight up called the Republic. <laughs> it doesn't have much of an actual name. Uh, but setting up a proper republic is hard to do. You know, they have to avoid falling back into tyranny, either the tyranny of the hordes or the tyranny of the boyars. The old aristocrats that they overthrew are still around, and it's difficult to spread republican ideals to other places that have never even heard of them. And due to the crisis, which goes throughout, again, all eight books of the series, uh, it's kind of tempting for the military to take over. So 
they, they have to deal with a lot of problems. It's not like just, okay, democracy wins the day and now everything's great. In a lot of ways, Lost Regiment is kind of like a ma more mature version of those shitty young adult dystopias from the early 2010s. You know, I, if you've watched my channel for a while, you'll know I do have a soft spot for those things, but they're often very dumb. Uh, the Lost Regiment is all about how freedom is worth fighting for in a very concrete way. And for that, I love it. That's basically the whole point of this section is that this story is really just about this one major theme, and for that, I really like it. It's kind of weird that the author also went on to write multiple books co-authored with Newt Gingrich. <laughs> I didn't do a good job of shoving that in there, but I just needed to let all of you know that the author of The Lost Regiment has also written several books with Newt Gingrich. That's suspicious. That's weird. I'm told that, uh, <laughs> that if you don't come, I can shoot you. So all of that leads me into the other main thing I loved about this series, and that is the heroes and the villains. Like, I'll start with the alien hordes. Uh, now again, the, the aliens, they don't actually get a name. They're, they're just called the hordes. Like, sometimes they call themselves the chosen race, but we're not given, like, an actual translation of that into English or anything and usually they just go by the name of their tribe, so just keep that in mind. The first book is about fighting the tribe that rules over the Rus, and they are called the Tugars. Then there's an arc about fighting another tribe, which uh, again, like I mentioned, they own the territory farther south, uh, they are called the Murky. And then there's an arc about a third tribe even further south than them called the Bantag tribe, but again, they're all the same race. They are similar to humans, but they're a lot bigger, a lot hairier, they have flat faces, and it's mentioned how their faces don't move as much in response to emotional state the way human faces do. Their technology level doesn't go beyond bows and arrows. Like, they fight each other, and they fight rebellions occasionally, but they have swords, spears, bows and arrows, that, that's about it. Their culture is kind of similar to Eurasian steppe nomads like Mongols or Huns, but they are far worse than them, par both in terms of just sheer brutality, and also just in the sense that they don't make anything themselves. Like, they don't grow food, they don't herd animals, they don't perform any sort of services. Their weapons and am armor are made by human slaves that travel with them, w which are called pets, you know. The humans that live in cities that they actually harvest and eat are called cattle. The humans that travel with them to be slaves are called pets. The point is, literally all that the hordes can do is hunt and fight. That's it. They, they, are they are parasites. They don't contribute to society, but they demand the fruits of everyone else's labor. And it's pretty clear that the nobility, who rule over the humans, are just their lackeys. They, they also contribute nothing. But this is the hordes. This is their way of life. They've been on this endless ride for thousands of years. They know nothing else. They're, they're basically just a metaphor for all sorts of aristocrats in human society. You know, again, like they... They don't create or produce anything, but they demand that other people give us some of what they produce, you know, that sort of thing. Now, the Hordes, they're not good people by any stretch, but they're not really evil either. And I know that might sound kind of strange to some of you who have read the books, but I mean, this is just, this is just what they know. You know, they truly view humans as animals whose natural state is slavery. When the rebellion kicks off, they think that humans have been possessed by demons, which sounds a little familiar. They aren't evil, they're just reacting to the world as they understand it, and they're also looking after themselves and their families. Like, as much as I hate them, uh, it's hard to blame them for acting in self-interest. And it's easier to say that sort of thing for aliens than it is for confederates, because they at least have the excuse of not being human, whereas confederates, they, they knew better. Like, they knew black people were human, they just also really liked owning other humans. And this idea of the hordes really not being evil, just reacting to the world as they see it, is best exemplified with the main antagonist of Book 1. His name is Musta, and he's the leader of the Tugar tribe. And keep in mind, every single one of these tribes is massive. The Tugars are the smallest, but they have hundreds of thousands of people, and pretty much every grown man in the tribe is a warrior. So the Lost Regiment is very outnumbered from the get-go. And Musta spends a lot of the book worried about and planning for the future, because a plague, which is later confirmed to be smallpox, is going, th spreading among the humans, and it's killing tons of them before the two guards can even eat them. So their food supply is in jeopardy. And when they fight the humans at the end, 
They're desperate and starving, so you can sympathize with them a little bit. And on top of that, Musta himself is a warrior. He has a code and he has a sense of honor. It's a skewed sense of honor, but he, he has one. By the end of the first book, he doesn't like the humans at all, but he does respect them. You know, he, he sees them as worthy foes, if nothing else. And it, I, I feel the need to mention that I couldn't find a good place to insert this organically, sorry, but like the hordes have spent a lot of time fighting each other, but it's all basically for sport. You know, they have a lot of experience fighting, but they would never once actually gone to war. And they spend eight books asking themselves what they're willing to sacrifice in order to win. And that's the same question that the humans are asking themselves throughout all of this. Which, like seeing parallels like this between the heroes and the villains is really neat. Musta also has an advisor named Kubata. And again, a lot of these names, I'm just, I'm just doing my best with them. <laughs> I apologize. But his name is Kubata. He's interesting too, and because he, he's very old, he's been living this way for decades, but he also knows that reforms are needed, and he tries, but he can't change his society single-handedly. And then, like I said, after the Tugars are dealt with, they, the next villains are the leaders of the Murky tribe, and they learn from Musta's mistakes. They utilize some human technology during their war, as well as some ancient technology from their ancestors. You're just going to have to read and find out for yourself what that is, because it's not what you're thinking. It probably isn't what you're thinking. Uh, and they try to turn the humans against each other. There are, there are actually several leaders throughout the murky. I'm not going to get into all of them right here, but they have an interesting and complex relationship with one another. You know, the scheming and maneuvering on their side is fascinating to read about. It basically boils down to a conflict between those who want to just put down this rebellion and then go back to the way things were before versus those who want to genocide and kill every human on the planet. But again, as nasty as they are, they're both looking out for their own people in their own weird, twisted way. And they're smart because they see the humans have some early victories in the first book and they adapt to that. They change their own uh, uh, tactics and they use some of their, again, new weapons that they manage to get and they win some victories over them. The humans are pretty much always off balance during that part of the story. Now, the last half of the series where they're fighting a third tribe called the Bantag, that has other villains who I'm not going to go into now because it's heavy spoilers, but they are different. They're a different breed to the others. I'll give them that. But the thing about villains is that no matter how complex they are, they don't really work unless they are a threat. You know, they have to be an obstacle for the heroes to overcome. And the hordes very much are a threat. Like, it would be so easy to write this as, one side has overwhelming numbers, other has better weapons, and then just go from there. And admittedly, there are times in the books where that is the case, but it, it, they're usually pretty short, and there's not any huge pivotal moments that are decided by, okay, we just, we just have better guns, and that's it, that's why we win. Both sides have multiple advantages and disadvantages that they have to learn to deal with. The hordes are physically way bigger. If things come to melee, then they have a huge advantage, and that is shown very clearly at several points. Unless they're in a small space, like inside a house or an alleyway or something, then it's kind of hard for them to move around, and the humans have the advantage. Their bows are, like, way bigger than a human longbow would be, so they actually shoot a bit farther than most of the guns that the humans have at first, but later the humans learn to make better guns. The humans have very few horses, like throughout the whole series, they have very, very few horses, so they move around the battlefield much slower, but they also have trains, which can carry far more men and material over long distances, and horses are mostly useful on the open step, like if you get them into different terrain, they're a lot less useful. The hordes rely on humans for everything, from food to manufacturing, and they might rebel against them or otherwise exist. Whereas the heroes are all working together, so they don't really have to keep an eye on their workers, you know, and so on. Like, both sides have a lot of advantages and a lot of disadvantages. And the calculus for this does change substantially in the second half with the Bantag, but again, spoilers. I really love having multiple advantages and disadvantages like this because it's far more interesting to watch people work to make the best of a bad situation or just screw up and make the worst of a good situation than have something as simplistic as one side big and numerous and the other side is plucky and brave. You know, I've, I've just seen a lot of stuff like that. Remember that shitty movie, The Tomorrow War, with Chris Pratt? Like, do you have any idea how easily the Lost Regiment could have turned into that? 
So because of all of this, the hordes are a big threat, and so the battles, as well as the smaller action scenes, all work really great. The author understood exactly how to play all of this stuff off of each other uh, in order to make those scenes tense and unpredictable. And, okay, so I've, I've spent a while talking about the villains, and that's because probably more than any other single aspect of this series, they are what make it work. But the heroes are still really good too. So we have the 35th Maine, which is led by Colonel Andrew Lawrence Keene, who is very obviously inspired by a real-life colonel from the American Civil War named Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain. Both of them were college professors before the war. They both won the Medal of Honor for their actions at the Battle of Gettysburg. Uh, in real life, Chamberlain led the defense of a hill called Little Round Top, and him and his men ran out of ammo, so he just led a bayonet charge straight down into the enemy. <laughs> if you've ever seen the movie Gettysburg, that charge is actually recreated very faithfully. We can't hold them again, sir. You know that. Well, if we don't, they go on by and over the hill and the whole flank caves in. We can't run away. If we stay here, we can't shoot. So let's fix bayonets. And I may as well say now, part of the reason I like these books so much is because part of my mom's family is from Maine, and they actually served in Maine units during the Civil War. And one of them, my five greats uncle, I think, uh, was named John Osbert Rafford. He was in the 20th Maine Infantry Regiment, which was Joshua Chamberlain's regiment. However, before you get too excited, he did leave the regiment before Gettysburg. We, we don't know exactly why he did, but he did. He was discharged or just deserted or something. Now, Colonel Andrew Keene from the books, uh, he was also holding the line against the a Confederate charge at Gettysburg, but in a different way. Uh, basically, the whole prologue of the first book is just showing him hold his position against overwhelming odds and save the day. But during the process, his brother is killed and he loses one of his arms to an artillery shell. But even after losing his brother and being crippled, he knows his men need him, and he believes in what he's fighting for. He believes all men are created equal, slavery will end. Full stop. And that's our introduction to this guy. So from the first chapter, we know exactly what sort of man he is, and he only gets better from there. Like, he's a smart commander who comes up with plans to save the day several times, but he's not like everyone's guardian angel who always saves the day. He does screw up several times. In fact, the main conflict of the second book happens just because Keen did screw up on something. He, he miscalculated. Watching him scramble to fix his own mistakes and avoid making them again is a big part of what makes these books really good military science fiction. Because, you know, just seeing some guy be awesome all the time and never screw up, like, sure, that works for a while, but after eight books, yeah, that, that would get really old. And the thing is, Keen doesn't do everything himself. Like, sometimes, in some crappy books, leader characters will be amazing and they will also do everything themselves, like Battlefield Earth is a pretty good example of that. Uh, but Keen, on the other hand, he participates, he helps, he comes up with plans, and he's in the fight sometimes, but his primary task really is organization and deciding where everyone is going to put their efforts. Like, he makes sure everyone has the resources they need to do their own jobs, and then they go and do that stuff. Uh, that's how a proper leader is supposed to act. And of course, it's his love of republicanism and the occasional struggle he has to hold on to his beliefs when they make contact with reality that births the republic in the first place and frees the humans of Valenia. So minor spoilers for the second book here. Uh, the second book, which is called The Union Forever, Keen and the Republic are in conflict with some other humans who are being strong-armed into fighting them by the hordes. And when they defeat the other humans, Keen immediately turns them into allies. Like, basically after the battle, he gives them some ships and sing says, hey, you guys can leave, you can go home, and if you bring back any of your people out of territory held by the hordes, we will keep them safe in the Republic. Because whatever else they were before, if somebody wants to fight the hordes, Keen is going to do his best to help them. Or whether, if they want to fight them or just run away. I, because he really does believe what he claims. He believes all men are equal. The hordes, on the other hand, never see anyone as true equals, and so because of that, they have trouble making and keeping allies. The humans that are working on behalf of the horde, they know that they'll be eaten as soon as they use lo use, uh, lose usefulness, and other horde members are constantly scheming against each other to gain power, so they all betray each other a lot. And this isn't a racial thing, it's, it's made pretty clear. Like, it's their government structure and ideology which causes them to act this way. It's just that the hordes are basically all aristocrats who rule over the humans, but then they have their own internal hierarchy as well. 
but that just leads to them seeing everyone as a tool. Whereas Keen and the other heroes actually do care about other people and they go out of their way to help them. So as a result, they make allies and they keep them. And remember, Keen is doing all of this with one arm. Like sometimes people say they want disabled representation, but then they praise crap like Fourth Wing, where the main character is only disabled at the beginning of the story and then she just powers through it, through it and it no longer bothers her. <clears throat> Keen, he can't do certain things. Like, there's a part where they have to put him in a basket and raise and lower him from the top of a tower, even though other people can just climb a ladder, because, well, he has one arm and he could easily fall and hurt himself, and they can't risk that. And he's a little embarrassed by it, but he just, he has to do it. But, and people still respect him anyways. He has to work with his disability, but it doesn't define him. Like, even in really small ways, like, it's mentioned at one point that he can't clean his own glasses because that's hard to do with only one hand. So he has to have someone else do it for him. Like he has to ask for help. That's, that's a thing disabled people have to deal with. If you're looking for disabled representation, don't read Fourth Wing, read Rally Cry. Uh, it's rare for the protagonist to be the most complex and interesting character in a book series, but Andrew Keane is someone I would trust to lead me through hell. And there are other great human characters on the good side too. Like there's Cal, he is a Rus peasant who is just, at first, he's scurrying around the shadows. He's extremely intelligent, but he has to hide it because he doesn't want to come across as a threat. Uh, he's really just trying to survive. But over the course of the series, he reaches his true potential and he becomes a proper leader. It, it shows pretty clearly how the monarchy was holding back a lot of talented people. And in spite of him suddenly becoming you know, much more important than he was before, he always remembers where he comes from. From and does his best to look after the common people. And then there's other men who aren't from Valenia, they're from America, uh, like Sergeant Major Hans Schuter, who he was the one who mentored Keen back when he first joined the army and showed him like how to actually become a soldier and run things. And when Keen's brother died, uh, it's made clear he, he's about to have a mental breakdown, but Hans brings him back to reality. He just says, hey, we can mourn later. We got shit to do right now. There's one scene when the regiment first lands on Valenia where the sun goes down and then they see the sky and there are two moons and this giant galaxy that you, they can see uh, up there and everyone realizes, oh shit, we are not home. And all the men start panicking. They stop uh, doing the work they were doing. They just drop to their knees and start praying. Hans is the one that goes around and gets them to focus and get back to work. He's a very old, very tired soldier who wants nothing but to rest, but he's also very good at being a soldier, and so people need him, and he refuses to just leave them to their fate. And this becomes a lot more obvious as the series goes on. He rises from a sergeant major to commanding whole armies by himself, and I feel like a lot of people watching this who either currently are NCOs or used to be NCOs are nodding in approval <laughs> upon, upon hearing that, thinking, yeah, I could definitely do a better job than the officers. Then there's Vincent Hawthorne. He is a Quaker who's only 17 years old and actually lied about his age so that he could join the army because he wanted to help end slavery, but he was also hoping to get through it without killing anyone. And very early on, he's forced to cast aside his pacifism and he becomes a fantastic soldier, but he also starts succumbing to violent impulses sometimes. And I'll be honest, his arc is never really finished. There's just a million small moments of bravery and heroism from tons of minor characters, some of whom are only there for a single scene and don't even get a name, uh, some of whom aren't even really characters, they're just one more face in the crowd of people, but the crowd itself is showing bravery and heroism. This was a team effort, and that's made clear from the beginning. Like, everyone did their part, and at the end they have an unshakable bond. And honestly, just watching all these men be friends and go to hell and back for each other is, is honestly heartwarming. Like, the biggest example of this is Keen and Hans, because at, these books take place over the course of about 10 years, and after a couple of books, each of them have sons. And Andrew names his son Hans, and Hans names his son Andrew. It's clear how much they mean to each other, but they never say it, they just show it. And that's a pretty good example of how healthy men's friendships do work. No man born to royalty, here we judge you by what you do, not by who your father was. I mentioned earlier that there are eight books in The Lost Regiment. It, it, really there's nine, but the last one is just more of a spin-off. I'm not going to talk about it much in this video. Uh, they are Rally Cry, The Union Forever, Terrible Swift Sword, Fateful Lightning, Battle Hymn, 
Never Sound Retreat, A Band of Brothers, and Men of War. And I'll be honest with you, the series does go on longer than it needs to. However, it does help a lot that the story changes up frequently. Like in book one, it's really just the heroes versus the two guards. They have one city, no allies, and it's them versus this massive horde. So it's the introduction to the world, it's the build up and preparation, and then the final battle. And I should also note that if you're feeling intimidated by going through eight books, then the first one, Rally Cry, works pretty well as a standalone story. Like, yeah, if you only read that, there will be a couple of plot threads that are left dangling, but not too much. It, it works pretty well as its own thing. Then books two through four go to a different story arc. It's about the newly formed Republic versus the Murky, because there's a bit of a time skip between books one and two. <clears throat> so now things are bigger and more complicated. Book two is largely about the heroes trying to rescue allies from danger, and it ends with a big battle, but it's also clear that this is just the beginning of a new conflict. It's not like the first one where they win, and then it's like, okay, cool, everything's gonna be great forever, right? Uh, maybe. Some of the books have smaller climaxes where the weight comes from something other than winning or losing a giant battle, but they all manage to be satisfying in their own way. Like, hell, I don't want to give away too much here, but one of the later books is specifically about a bunch of slaves trying to escape from Horde territory to the Republic. It's, it's way different than other stuff, but it's still very intense. And then there's another time skip after that story arc ends, and we go to books five through eight, which is the whole back half of the story, and that's about the Republic when it's been much more firmly established versus the band tag. And the final showdown in the last book is actually a lot different than you might expect. I won't say much here due to spoilers, but it, it is a lot different than I expected, certainly. Splitting the series up into arcs and shaking up the expected formula does help keep things fresh, so even though it's eight books, it doesn't feel that long, and it manages to continue escalating up until the end without feeling ridiculous. Like, that's... That's a thing you see sometimes, where stuff just escalates way too much and doesn't have anywhere to go, so it just breaks the rules of its own setting so it can escalate more. Like, a lot of shonen anime does this, you know, where episode 1, the heroes have to fight bullies. Episode 10, they're fighting a local warlord. Episode 600, there's a god that came out of nowhere that now they have to fight. You know, so by the end, it's almost unrecognizable. The Lost Regiment avoids that issue because it's really obvious from day one that this can only end one of two ways. Either the humans are freed, or the humans are condemned to be cattle for as long as they exist. From very early on, there is no turning back. See, when the men of the 35th Maine first meet the Hordes, they are given a chance to submit, and they refuse, and basically from that point forward, they were all dead men walking. It was fight or die. And at first, the Hordes really just want to kill the ringleaders and then let things go back to exactly as they were before. You know, ride around the world, exact tribute, and repeat. But once they realize the ideological contagion that the Yankees brought is going to spread and inspire more rebellions, they decide that genocide is the only path forward. Like, in the first book, they decide, again, minor spoilers, but it seems like something you should expect, if I'm being honest, uh, they decide pretty quickly that, okay, we're just going to destroy this entire city and kill everyone in it as a message to everyone else. And then later, they escalate even further and decide they're going to kill all the rebelling humans here because they're an actual threat and we can't allow them to spend time preparing and building up further. Then they're going to move on and wipe out every human on Valenia. Like, the, the point I'm getting at here is that the stakes are impossibly high to start, and they only get higher, and there's never an option to surrender. Every moment of fear and panic feels genuine because you know exactly what happens to people if they lose. The hordes eat the humans they kill. Full stop. If, if you're captured alive, you'll be horrifically tortured until you're dead, and then you'll be eaten. Like, there, in the first book, we get to see, described in a lot of detail, something called the Moon Feast, where humans are strapped down, and they have the top of their skulls sawed off while they're still alive, and then they, their brains get scooped out, and... Obviously, that's what kills them, but the idea is to keep them alive for as long as possible. And we know that this is going to happen to everyone if the heroes lose. So when a hundred thousand Tugar warriors emerge over the horizon, charging and baying for blood, we are just as scared and determined to win as the heroes are. Military science fiction often has this weird problem where they focus too much on what is happening without enough focus on why it's happening. However, The Lost Regiment doesn't have that problem. It's people fighting to be free from being even worse than slaves. And later on, they're fighting against genocide. So 
the why is always clear. We're always going to care about what happens. And like I mentioned earlier, the hordes do learn and change over time. That's part of what makes them so dangerous as foes. At first, their main threat is as a Zerg rush, you know, just charge in and overwhelm the defenders. But as they get better weapons and they learn more about how the humans fight, their tactics and their strategies become a lot more complex. And the humans learn to make better technology and develop the Republic more economically. So, you know, they're, they're building more railways, more factories, they're training a bigger army, you know, that, that sort of thing. So throughout all of this, both sides are always getting stronger. And I never knew exactly which direction things were heading in, but they were always in a satisfying direction. And that way, when the big moments hit, they hit hard. It's also pretty clear that this is the only chance humanity will ever have to overthrow the hordes. Like, before this, they didn't have the weapons and ability to mass produce weapons that they would need to overthrow the hordes. And after this, the hordes will simply roll over any newcomers before they have a chance to build. Like, they, they aren't going to give the next guys warning, they're just going to kill them all. And there's a story that the hordes tell a couple of times about another race that came through the Tunnel of Light thousands of years ago. Uh, they had much more advanced weaponry than the humans do now. Uh, there were lasers of some sort, uh, and, but they had no time to prepare, so they were just immediately overwhelmed and killed. If Keen and the Republic fail, that's it. No more chances. Every human that ever sets foot on Valenia from that moment forward, most of whom, again, are just transported there accidentally and don't want to be there, will die. So the Lost Regiment has a lot to enjoy. It has solid characters, it has a tense and exciting plot, a general positive vibe to it, which is strange to say when you see how grim and violent this gets at times. <laughs> like, but you never forget that these guys are fighting for freedom and that freedom is not a vague and intangible thing. It's the ability to make a choice to know that you and your loved ones won't be used up and consumed by more important people. Okay, so while I love the Lost Regiment, it isn't perfect. The first thing is that several character arcs and plot threads just sort of fizzle out and die without going anywhere. Uh, I mentioned this earlier with Vincent Hawthorne, you know, seeing a Quaker kid becoming a killing machine and trying to deal with that mentally, like that sounds fascinating, but it just never goes anywhere. Characters mention how he's getting bad and then nothing. There's, there's no conclusion to his arc at all. There's a similar thing which happens with another character named Hamilcar, who th there's a city which is descendants of Carthaginians, and so the leader is called Hamilcar. And I, I don't want to get into too much because he's a pretty minor character, but he has the same issue where his arc seems to be going in kind of an interesting direction and then it just dies out and I have no idea what became of him by the last book. And from pretty early on in the series, the Republic knows it has to expand and get bigger, otherwise it will be vulnerable to attacks. And there's one book in particular, excuse me, where it's mentioned that they are trying to expand more and more eastward so that they can get, you know, important resources, not just manpower, but other resources. And there are some new areas that they want to absorb into the Republic. One of them is called Asgard, which is the descendants of Norse people. And one is called Nippon, which is just descendants of Japanese people. Also, Nippon is literally just... That, that's literally just the name for Japan. <laughs> Not using a lot of imagination here. But both of those places are introduced and then they just sort of disappear, at least until the last book. And then Nippon gets mentioned a few times, but it doesn't actually do anything. And the thing is, realistically, even with the outside threat, it should be very difficult to get all these people from very different cultures and very different racial backgrounds to work together. Uh, because, again, the Americans come and the first real allies they make are Russians and descendants of some Romans. Like, they, again, Romans and Carthaginians, they hate each other, and the Roman city is just called Raum, or Rum. I'm actually not sure how to say that, but again, not using a lot of imagination. <laughs> now, it does make sense how they would be willing to work with both of those guys because they're both largely viewed as white. Please note the quotes around that because what groups of people are and are not white changes a lot depending on time period and location. However, the, the Yankees, they're, they're representative of American ideals, sure, but they're also a bunch of mid-19th century white dudes. Like, the U.S. Army, it fought to free the slaves, and it also fought to commit genocide against the Native Americans. Uh, pe people contain multitudes, is, is what I'm saying here. The point is that the lack of racism coming from the Americans 
did stretch my suspension of disbelief quite a bit. Especially near the end when, again, they're, they're perfectly fine letting in Japanese people and later Chinese people and black people. Like, they're, they're perfectly fine bringing them all in and giving them equal rights and everything. And I just... Eh... Sure. I mentioned that the story manages to stay fresh throughout most of the word count. However, it is still just... it's too long. Like, they could have condensed a few things and finished it in six or seven books. Like, that... I don't have a whole lot of specifics to go into there, just like, I feel like things could have been condensed. I also didn't like the spin-off, which is called Down to the Sea. Like, it, it's trying to set up yet another, even bigger conflict, but it never got the sequels that it was aiming for, so it's kind of unfinished. You know, it, it's kind of neat to glimpse at the Republic 20 years later, so that we can see how things have been going with the characters we know and love, but I think it would have been a lot better if it was just a brief epilogue at the end of book eight, Men of War, and there's also one thing that is very, very small, but the titles of these books, they, they annoy me. Five-eighths of the books have titles that are taken from the lyrics to Civil War songs, you know, stuff like Terrible Swift Sword, Never Sound Retreat, The Union Forever, you know, and I really love that, I, because it ties in with the setup of the story, you know, it's American Civil War soldiers fighting slavery and standing up for republicanism. But the last two books are just called A Band of Brothers and Men of War. And while those aren't bad, they're also very generic military sci-fi, you know? Like, they, again, they're not bad, but they just don't tie into the themes or the actual events of the story in any way. And they also don't scream finale to me. You know, Men of War. That's just... You could put that on basically any military sci-fi book and it would fit. Now, with a series specifically, you want the titles to escalate until the final confrontation so that everything feels like it's coming to a head. You know, even if you're not actually reading, if you just look at the spines of them and read through the titles, you still feel like there's an escalation there. That's how you draw in new audience members. Weirdly enough, young adult novels are usually pretty good at this. <laughs> Do you remember Divided We Fall? Like, I, I wish I didn't, but... The titles are good, you know, as bad as the books themselves are, the titles are really good. Because it goes Divided We Fall, Burning Nation, and The Last Full Measure. It's the beginning of the conflict, the unpleasant consequences of the conflict, and the final battle which will decide the fate of America for good. Or another crappy YA series that fits this would be Matched. You know, it, it goes Matched, Crossed, and Reached. So it gives the impression of stakes escalating and the heroes overcoming their foes, even though barely anything happens in those books, they're, they're very, very empty. So for The Lost Regiment, the last couple of books should have had titles that reflected the final confrontation and victory. You know, instead of Men of War, here are some other suggestions for what you could have called it. Die to Make Men Free. The Flag That Makes Men Free. Cry of Freedom. Faded Coat of Blue. Like, again, those are all lyrics from Civil War songs. And if you didn't want to use any of those, you could have just swapped titles with the earlier books because, you know, you just put Men of War somewhere in the middle because, again, these titles don't really tie in, into anything specific that happens in individual books. So you could swap them around in any order and it would still be fine. But, like, swap Men of War to somewhere in the middle and then the last book would be ne Never Sound Retreat or The Union Forever because those both would have worked a lot better as the final title. And you... There's no easy way to say this. These books needed a much much better editor. Oh my goodness. There, there are several details here that are brought up and then contradicted later on. You know, e.g., e I mentioned Asgard earlier. Uh, originally, it was between the Republic and Nippon, but later Asgard isn't there. At, like, Nippon just moved farther west, I guess. Uh, plus, there's spelling and grammatical errors, like, at least one or two every book. Like, the last book straight up has a point where a sentence repeats twice in a row, and I'm just like, guys, Someone should have caught that, you know, I, it, it's not really the author's fault at that point, and it didn't ruin anything, I just wish it had better quality control. So, that is about it for all of the non-spoiler stuff I can say, positive or negative, about The Lost Regiment. It, it is a great book series, you know, it has compelling heroes and villains alike, it has great battle, scene, battle scenes, a lot of technical talk about how guns and stuff work, which I find interesting, but it doesn't go on too, too long, so if that is something that you don't like, it, at least it'll be over quickly. Military science fiction is very much a niche, but this is one of the best examples of that niche that I've ever come across. And if anything here appeals to you, 
I implore you to check it out. Like, seriously, book one works as a standalone, so if you're not feeling up to reading eight, you don't have to. Uh, anyways, now we're going into the spoiler section. Uh, this is some of what I loved or disliked about the later books. Why is that interesting? Well, it's not really, I suppose. Sometimes I'll just say something to get me from one sentence to the other, Joe. So, the first spoiler ties into my last video, because The Lost Regiment has a very specific problem that Vampire Academy also had. Namely, that the best scene in the series is a scene of one of the heroes dying, but then it turns into a fake-out, and in retrospect, it means much less. So, like, in Vampire Academy, if you haven't watched my video on that, basically, the main character, Rose, uh, goes off to kill her boyfriend because her boyfriend was turned into an evil vampire called a Strigoi, and there's no cure for that, so she has, has to go and kill him because he would rather be dead than wind up like that. And when she finally catches him and kills him, it is the moment where she lets him go and she frees him from being a Strigoi. However, they pretty quickly retcon this and go, oh no, she actually missed his heart when she stabbed him, so he just comes back and is in later books. And in The Lost Regiment, it's Keen basically miscalculating and he gets an army that's led by Hans cut off and it gets cut off and destroyed. And the scene where Hans dies is genuinely amazing because the army is desperately trying to escape getting surrounded. The trains to help them escape are literally within sight. Like, they can see them. They're, they're right there. But the enemy was prepared and it cuts them off and they get surrounded and massacred. And as they're dying, they all sing Battle Hymn of the Republic, and the voices, one by one, just go silent. And after that, for a while, Keen just has to sit with the fact that his mistake killed all those men, including his best friend. But then, later on, it's revealed that Hans was captured alive, and he's being held as an important prisoner. And th this is all during the second story arc, where they're fighting the Murky, and that arc ends without Hans really, it, it doesn't go anywhere. Any of the stuff with Hans goes anywhere. However, he does tie in much more into the last half of the series, which I will now go into spoilers on that. So basically, the Tunnels of Light are left over from tens of thousands of years ago. Like, the Hordes had a spacefaring empire. It went across galaxies, and Valenia was just their homeworld, but there was some big cataclysm which destroyed everything, broke it apart, and so all the Hordes are living in this I don't know if I want to call it a wasteland, but it's definitely a post-apocalyptic setting. And sometimes the Tunnels of Light will randomly reactivate and bring people to Valenia. Uh, not just humans, but uh, aliens from other planets as well, including descendants of hordes who colonize these other planets. And Book 5, Battle Him, begins with members of the Horde from another planet getting taken through the tunnel. It's not that many of them, it's just a couple of soldiers from a world with technology far beyond what the humans have. Like, they're, they're able to recreate some of their technology, but not all of it. They make references to jet engines and nuclear weapons and stuff like that, so it's pretty clear that their technology is pretty close to modern-day Earth. And one of the soldiers, a guy named Hark? It, it's spelled like this, I, I'm pretty sure Hark is how you pronounce that. He manages to convince the Bantag, who are the local horde in that area that he gets teleported to, that he is a prophesized chosen one and he takes them over. And then he spends years building up the Bantag, using human slaves to build factories with modern rifles, battleships, tanks, which they call land cruisers, and some other stuff. And then he also trains his new army in modern warfare. Basically, he's just planning to wipe out all of the humans. And he buys Hans to be a slave. More specifically, he wants him to be an overseer in a steel mill, because as a guy who led soldiers, Hans has experience organizing and leading people. Hans is there for several years, and we see in very explicit detail the sort of conditions that people are living under there, and eventually he stages a breakout. You know, most of Battle Him is him and a couple other uh, hundred slaves on the run trying to reach the Republic. They both need to warn them about how, hey, uh, these guys are planning to attack and they have crazy weapons that the other hordes don't have, but also, you know, to just stay safe and not be slaves anymore. Like I said, the books don't all follow the same formula. It helps keep things fresh. And I just want to point out that being a slave made Hans less racist. <laughs> so that's good, because he does mention that he didn't really care for black people beforehand, but then he made friends with some of the slaves who were there who were also black, and he realized that they're all the same. So 
I guess, hey, silver lining to that cloud. This also just makes him sympathize much more with the slaves and other humans who live outside of the Republic for the rest of the series, because he advocates for continuing the revolution and exporting the, wa the war all over the world until everyone is free, because the hordes are never going to leave them be, and letting people suffer under their rule only gives them a resource to exploit. You know, like I mentioned, they're using human slaves to run all these factories and everything. They aren't doing that themselves. Without that source of labor, they would be in trouble. But anyways, that's a long-winded way of me saying that in the second half of the series, the hordes have modern weapons. They have modern transport, they have modern training. In some ways, it's beyond what even the humans have. So things are a lot different after this. You know, the battles are much closer to modern ones and the humans have lost their technological edge. So the idea of bringing in people from yet another isekai world to shake things up Sure, I guess I, I like that. That sounds neat, at least on paper. But I, I just think it would have been better if the one who was a slave and was forced to escape wasn't Hans, you know? There's a lot of minor characters that I think deserved a bit more spotlight. It could have just been one of them. Because Hans does die for real in the final book, and it hits with less force when it's for the second time, you know, because you gave us that fake out. If Hans had only really died once, I think, whichever death it was would have hit substantially harder. Just throwing that out there. And for the last few books, the Republic is really just on the back foot. You know, they're no longer fighting barbarians on horses, and they're just almost out of resources. You know, manpower, food, iron, coal, etc. So bringing in newcomers does work as a way to raise the stakes, but it also just doesn't make that much sense the way it's done. Because it's just a few soldiers that came, come over and they're just regular infantrymen. You know, it's mentioned that Hark was a scholar beforehand, so he knows about engineering and stuff, but the idea that he could know enough to help others design and build, from memory, submarines, airships, rifles, artillery, trains, ammunition, tanks, grenades, and more, well, that's just ludicrous. Even setting that aside, like, okay, let's pretend that Hark was carrying a bunch of blueprints when he went through the Tunnel of Light or something. But even setting that aside, it doesn't add up. It just doesn't. Because the Bantag have millions of slaves to work to death as a labor source, force. It makes sense that they can make a lot of stuff. But the quality of that stuff should be much lower. Because in books 2 through 4, when the heroes are fighting the Murky, the Murky have artillery, but they don't really have anything else in the way of modern weapons. You know, they don't have rifles or anything. And it's mentioned more than once that the Murky artillery fires a high number of duds. Like, there are multiple parts where an artillery shell lands near some characters and then fails to explode. The craftsmanship of these things is really poor, which makes sense. You know, they're designed by people who didn't know very much, and they are built by starving, half-dead slaves. And so you would think this would be a factor with the band tag as well, because the thing is, slave labor is inefficient. Like, individual workers do less work to begin with. Just just full stop. They, they do less work because they don't want to be there. But they also sometimes will sabotage their own work. Like, again, if you look at the American Civil War or the Axis powers during World War II, the Confederates and the Axis both utilized slave labor really, really heavily in their economies. And in both cases, slaves sabotaged their own work or they just worked really slowly and that caused issues for the war effort. Like, if, you ever, if you've ever seen Schindler's List, you remember there was a scene where Amon Guth con confronted that slave worker because he was working too slow. Uh, and then he tried to execute him, but his gun, which was probably also made by slaves, just wouldn't fire. Get such a small pile of pinches. That sort of thing really did happen. It was actually a very big problem for Germany by the end of the war because Slaves make inefficient workers. The reason that people did it back then and today is because slavery is more profitable than paying workers. So it's good for whoever owns that labor, but it's bad for the war effort and bad for the economy as a whole. And at one point, Hans remarks that the railway tracks the Bantag slaves are laying are really poor quality. Because again, they're, they're made by people, placed by people that don't know what they're doing and don't want to be there. So I just kept thinking that at some point a gun would misfire at an important time or some important machinery would break down and that would give the humans the chance they needed to counterattack or something, but 
it just never happens. You know, slavery does come back to bite the Bantag in the ass, but it bites them in the ass in that they have a full-scale rebellion. Which does make sense, but there are other ways in which utilizing slave labor is bad for a society. And I think that showing how a society built on slave labor is ultimately doomed to collapse, I just think that would fit a lot better with the themes of the story. But that does all bring me to the final battle of the series, because <clears throat> by this point the Republic is truly, truly just on its last legs. They have nothing left to fight with and their government is consider considering suing for peace, allowing the Bantag to keep territory that they've stolen. But this is going to break up the Republic and leave them easy pickings for the Hordes. So Hans leads a small force in some airships, because... Yeah, airships actually play a pretty big role in this story. Because <laughs> it's mentioned that the gravity on Millennia is lower than it is on Earth, so they're able to make airships with that kind of technology. But anyways, uh, Hans leads a small force in some airships to head to the Bantag manufacturing heartland to stir up a slave revol revolt and destroy their ability to wage war. Uh, also, by this point, Hark got killed by his lieutenant, so now that guy is in charge. I I don't have much to say there. Like, the, Hark wasn't a very interesting villain. Like, he was cunning, but also incompetent in important ways. And his replacement is a guy named Jurak, who, he kind of amused me just because he feels like an annoyed employee who was told he needs to work this weekend. <laughs> you know, he just really wants to go home, but he can't, so he just does the best he can to lead the Bantag to victory. But it might have been better if he was, like, the power behind the throne manipulating Hark the whole time, but whatever, that's not important. Anyways, Hans leads a raid and gets multiple cities to rise up and start killing their masters. And they also just start you know, smashing up all the machinery, destroying factories, like just doing everything they can to hinder the war effort, basically. However, they don't have very many weapons, so the final battle in the last book is kind of a reverse of the final battle in book one, where one side had overwhelming numbers and fanaticism, but the other side had much better technology. Only this time it's the humans who are on the back foot in terms of technology, but they just have overwhelming numbers. However, the slaves are between the Bantag and their homes, and their homes are, you know, full of old people, women, and kids who don't have any protection. So Hans tells the Bantag, like, hey, if, if we feel like we're about to lose and people break and run, I can't prevent these people from running to go attack the civilians. Like, these are fanatical slaves that hate you with every fiber of their being. If they have a chance to try and lets out some of that anger on the civilians back there. I can't stop them. He's essentially holding them hostage, which, in terms of morality, uh, that's not good, but it is hard to blame him in this situation. So basically, the Bantag leaders agree to surrender and leave, and their families will be returned one at a time as long as they obey terms that the Republic sets. However, one of the leaders of the Horde still wants to kill all the humans, so he tries to kill Jurak, and then Han saves him, dying in the process. Meanwhile, though, because there's actually kind of two climaxes happening simultaneously, Keen is trying to prevent the government from surrendering, but ultimately, as a military commander, he is taking his orders from them at the end of the day. So he just publicly resigns and says, you people are stupid, and he, then he leaves the city, and so the people of the city rise up and throw out their leaders, replacing them with people who are going to continue the fight, which not is it's, it's not really necessary anymore because the fight's over, but... The point is, that's what they did. And that was great, because I kept expecting the series to do the thing that military sci-fi loves doing for some reason, where the civilian government doesn't understand how things work and the military has to take over, but no, that doesn't happen. Uh, the people rise up and get rid of the government themselves. And it's not even that violent, they just make it clear who works for who. So there were two simultaneous climaxes and they were both great. And it's easy for people to feel like Keen, the protagonist, doesn't fight in the final battle, but like his job was just as important, because Hans saved the Republic in a physical sense, he's the one that actually ended the war, but Andrew Keane saved it in a spiritual sense. He made it clear that it is run by the people for the people. Like he could have taken over, it's made clear that if he just uh, told the crowd to rise up and get behind him, they would have done it, but then the Republic would cease to be a Republic. It would be a country of strong men masquerading as democratic. And I, I just love this so much because it shows how Hans and Keen really relied on each other. Neither of them would have made it this far without the other. And they never say what they feel, they just show it. You know, the last scene is actually Hans' funeral, and Keen puts his Medal of Honor on Hans' grave, and there's very few words spoken, but he does say that he wouldn't have won it without Hans' help and tutelage. He, he says, 
this was always yours, I was just holding on to it for a while. But he never said that to Hans when he was alive, because he didn't need to. And I'll admit, I did tear up a bit at that. This might be one of those things where, like, oh, girls don't get it because th like, that's just how men's relationships work. <laughs> but I, I promise, it's, it's a very touching scene. There is so much stuff to cover in this series. Also, it's really hot in here. <laughs> I'm wearing a hoodie. It's, it's summertime. I shouldn't be doing that. Uh, and I've, I've just, I've talked enough about this, okay? It's awesome. I loved it. If you're wondering why pulp sci-fi from the 90s connects with me more than a lot of modern stuff, it's because, as I said earlier, it's earnest. It doesn't have any moments where it's like, oh, wow, that, this setup is super goofy. Uh, but it's also, you know, about something. You know, Marvel Cinematic Universe movies used to be earnest. They would take some goofy ideas and play them straight. Like the first Iron Man movie, that's a pretty goofy idea, but it plays it straight and so it works. And now they wink at the camera every two minutes to know that, like, oh yeah, don't, don't worry, we know this is dumb. Don't think we're cringe, guys. That's what I mean when I say it's earnest. But when I say it's about something, I mean it has a concrete storyline and definable themes. Like, it's a little cheesy and ham-fisted at times, but the Lost Regiment is all about how freedom is worth fighting for. It's better to die on your feet than live on your knees, always at the mercy of someone else. That's all. This video's too long already. Goodbye. Hello there, friends, and people who aren't friends but watched this far for whatever reason. Uh, thank you. Uh, all these names you see on screen here, these are my $5 and up patrons. And a special, special thanks to my $10 and up patrons, who are Arthur D. Gonzalez Martin, Brother Santodes, Carolina Clay, Ich bin Langweilig, Kiana Arms, Lexi Delorme, Liza Rudakova, Lord Tiebreaker, Michael and Katie Hake, Mr. A5013, Pros Proscriptions of Zhuo Jang, Rovi, Psych XS, Slumbering Jello Jellyfish, Observing Outer Space, Tesla Shark, Toa Michael, Bay Victus, and Wesley. Thanks to all of them. Without them, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to do this. If you want to get your name here, then consider donating on my Patreon page. Or becoming a YouTube channel member, you can get early access to videos, as well as some other exclusive videos every month. If that sounds like fun, then go ahead. If you don't feel like doing that, you know, rate the video, comment, subscribe. That also works. I appreciate you no matter what. Uh, thanks for watching. Goodbye.